repent of some things, just wearing myself out, violating, you know, Sabbath rest, all kinds of stuff that I, you just have to deal with that, right? Well, doesn't mean I don't believe in healing. Some people will, yeah, but you were sick. Yeah. So was Trophimus. Paul said, I left him, my, my lead is sick. And people read that verse, you can see, see, well, it doesn't mean he was sick forever. <laughs> He's like me and you, he may be under attack. But that resistance that comes, saying no, no. I, I, I'm so excited about, even though it hit, I'm looking at eyes right now where COVID hit. But you know what? I see y'all standing here. Didn't have any funerals. Amen. God's good. Amen. See, that needs to be duplicated in every believer in this city and then every sinner that becomes a believer in this city. Got to push it out. But it takes time. It takes time. And it takes having an expectation, just a tone of, Lord, I want you to continually work in my life. I want you to continue. Lord, just paint. Just paint. Just draw. Just write. Write upon my heart, God. Amen. Let's let him do that some more tonight. Amen. Let's head back in. Go ahead, guys.
Take a moment, draw a circle around yourself. That line that says that you are mine and I am yours. Would you just put Jesus in that circle with you and just make a personal rededication that you are his and his alone. That above ev anything and everything else, that you are his. Because he's making that same, same dedication to you. That he is yours. That he is yours. Take a moment. Just reaffirm your fidelity, your fealty, your loyalty. Reaffirm that to him face to face. You are mine. I am yours. There's no other God I will bow my knee to. There's no other God that I will obey like I obey you. There's no other God that I will sing praise of. I will give no praise to any other God but you. I will heed no other God than, your, than you. You are my God. There is no other. Hallelujah. In that moment, just lift your hands and just worship him just for a moment. Take a moment just to minister to him. We do believe, we praise you, we worship you. Oh, oh. 
Lord, we do praise you and magnify you and bless your holy name. Hallelujah. Look at me just for a moment. You know, because you do pledge your love and fidelity to him, he demonstrates and shows us the example of what love is. Because we loved him, he loves us, and we love him because he first loved us. But if you really, really love him, you're going to love the people around you as well. So would you turn around and tell somebody, man, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Go ahead and tell them. Just tell them, I love you and there's really nothing you can do about it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. Back at you. Back at you. I love you. Nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Aren't you glad? Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Mighty God. Mighty, mighty, mighty God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Did you hear about the guy that went to heaven? And uh, when he got up there, he said, y'all have testimony meetings around here? He asked the angel, he said, do, do y'all have a testimony meetings around here? He goes, yeah, we, actually we do. He goes, well, I want to testify God, how God delivered me from the Ohio flood. There's never been a flood quite like it, but God rescued me from the Ohio flood. And I want to testify about how God rescued me from the Ohio flood. There's never been a flood like this in all, all my lifetime, but God rescued me from the Ohio flood. And the angel said, that's wonderful. We'd love to hear that, but just know that Noah will be in the crowd. <laughs> aren't you glad aren't you glad for your testimony <laughs> hallelujah speaking of testimonies uh anybody got a testimony i'm gonna call on one one young man i already got, i already kind of warned him i'm gonna call on him but uh, anybody have a testimony of what the lord's done for you just since sunday morning just said Sunday, just said Sunday morning in these meetings, something that he's done, we'll, I, I'll, we'll take, we'll open it up a little bit more in a minute. Yes, sir. Yeah, for the online group. We, uh, Thanks for being online with us. I had, uh, I got a, a red convertible Cadillac for my business. And I was doing a lot of work on it. Had it for a couple, couple months. Took it out to my friend who has a muffler shop out in Junction City. Put a brand new exhaust system on it. Backed it out. Five minutes later, a guy came across Highway 99. Oh no, I know. With a big I think I know this truck. story. And he bounced off of my car, hit it pretty good, and saved the hundred thousand dollar Corvette next to me. <laughs> saved the saved the 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 motorhome next to that. Went down, flipped over, went plowing through, totaled out two more cars, and smashed into a motorhome. And, uh, you know, I went, I, I, w I had just left. He was said, I'm going to be about another hour. He was, the car was on the rack. I left, went, had breakfast, came back. I was coming back. I says, wow, what's going on down there? All those lights and everything. I said, what's, all, what, what's that hanging off the back of my car? <laughs> all of the bumper and everything. Oh, wow. So anyway, so um, I got to praying about this. And I said, God. You know, first of all, when I went to go look at this car, I was kind of against my better judgment because it was a little old and had a little rust and everything. You know, I usually don't, you know, 
I usually, and it wasn't, didn't seem like a God deal. You know what I mean? I kept running it by God for a long time. He said, get it. So I got in it. Wilsonville, I drove all the way to Drain, preached the gospel at the, the um, North Douglas County Fair, <laughs> praised the Lord all morning with them, uh, got a big paycheck, got a big offering, and I said, it paid. The next day, I did a commercial for the Eugene Emeralds at the stadium, and it paid again. And I said, what is up? This car's making money and everything else. He says, what about Cottage Grove? So, oh, yeah, we went to Cottage Grove, and I went to the car show, and the little old lady pulled up behind me, and she says, oh, is that a 75 Cadillac Eldorado convertible? And I said, yeah. She said, would you like another one? And I said, well, uh, what, what, do you, what do you got? And she said, well, my dad passed away about 12 years ago. And we, you know, we'd start this car up like once a month. It's in my, in my shop down there. And the whole thing is, the whole thing is like, you know, perfect. There's not a scratch on it. This one's all, but if I didn't have this one, she wouldn't have seen that one. Would so I went, wow. I went over to go look at this thing. Wow. And I'm going, uh, well, 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 you know, it's half the price of what I paid for this one, and it's ten times better. And I said, well, okay, I, I don't have That's room for God it, right? Thing. See, my <laughs> barn's already full. How many got the full barn? Yeah, 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 How yeah. How many got the full storehouse? Yeah, the, yeah, The treasure, yeah. how many? You know, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I already got a problem. Now I said, hey, you know, baby, uh, maybe I can give you a down payment, and we'll hold it, and I'll come. I got to clean, sell a car. I got a Lincoln and a, you know, Cadillac and co other stuff I got to sell, you know, because God's been blessing me real good. So anyway, so, so anyway, so I'm praying about this. I said, now the car's smashed up out here. God, I'm a little upset, right? And I wake up this morning and God says, you know what the car is? It's a money magnet. I said, wait a minute. He said, okay, so that new Cadillac I got is worth about at least 10,000 more than what she wants for it. So that's 10,000 came in last month. And then, <laughs> then I just went to the estimator today and they said, ooh, it's going to be about 12, 13, maybe even 15. You got to go over to another place just to fix this other Cadillac, which, and she knows I got a shop and, you know, she knows I can do a lot of this and it'll look pastor knows about me but yeah and i thought well you know i could probably do it for about three so i so the car just keeps bringing in ten thousand dollars a month <laughs> Is that a, hallelujah and i went against my better judgment i leaned not on my own to say i kept saying holy spirit you got to show me on this that's you know? awesome so then last night uh my dog was barking when I got home. I said, I'm kind of tired. It was a long service last night. <laughs> anyway. Long-winded preacher said, last night. I remember when Brother Moore used to say, can you take a little bow? And he'd go yeah. another hour. You know. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. My so last I got home. I was a little more. tired. I went to sleep. And uh, my dog started barking. And he's, you know, he doesn't bark that much at night. Now. What, what the heck's going on out here? You know? And I thought, well, okay, it's so stupid deer eating, the, eating our grapes. Because we got plenty of grapes. The grapevines are filling up. You know, like the promised land down there. So, <laughs> so. Uh, we get up this morning and mama starts up the truck and it goes, Boo -boo 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 -boo. somebody stole our catalytic converter last night. Yeah. So and that was the day yesterday is when the car got hit. So you know what I said? I said, Lord, what's this? He says, I'm going to you wake up call because we got a contractor. Where is he? He's over here. We got a contractor coming out Monday to help us build up some security and fix our barn up and everything else. And I said, well, you know what? I hope that guy really needed to feed his kids because I'm gonna call that I'm gonna call that seed, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pray and and tell Lord help him because he's got a bad harvest coming, and and I thanked him for the wake up call. Praise God. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd share that with you. Praise y'all. God. That's awesome. That's awesome. How many want how many how many else want a car that'll bring you ten thousand dollars a month? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll take two. <laughs> Do you have a test? Anybody have a testimony? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Grab the mic so the online audience can hear you. It's, it's more of a uh, awakening in my spirit of something you said last night. And I told my wife, I actually text her and then I told her when I got home, but she was asleep. So I had to retell the story in the morning. But what he said, what the man of God said was the blessing. I wrote blessings. He said, no, 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 no blessing because i'm blessed the blessing of the lord is to prosperity as yeah. power yeah is to healing yeah when my wife got healed sunday yeah and i got blessed. the blessing of the lord <laughs> so now we're waiting for what's next what's yeah. next yeah that's awesome I, anybody else yes miss Jeannie, over here yeah right over here 
How many don't mind a testimony or two? We like testimonies. Yeah. Um, so mine's not about this Sunday. It's about two years ago when Jeff was here. Uh, two years ago when Jeff was here, he stood in that corner and he kind of looked out at all of us and he said, this church, you need to save some money. And uh, I heeded that. I, it, it got into my spirit. I don't know if it was a personal word for me. I'm sure it was for everybody. But me, I took it personally and I put some money away. And uh, we are, what, 20 months into COVID and my business is in really good shape. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, just, um, mm. you know, the Lord provided and he, you know, Malachi 310 mm. says, bring all your tithes to the storehouse. And I've done yeah. that for almost 15 years. And yeah. um, I mean, dedicated. I was kind of a sporadic tither before that. Um, but, you know, in Malachi 3.11, it says, and he'll rebuke the devourer for you. Yeah. I don't know every yeah. scripture like a lot of people know it, but I know it says that, no, he won't hurt any of my vine. Yeah. Or, you know, he's, he's yeah. not going to touch anything. And the Lord told me, stand firm. Yeah. Thanks for those words where he gave you in the very beginning. And thanks for your word, Jeff, because it saved me. I would not, yeah. flavors wouldn't be there. And, you know, as flavors grew, I took on some extra spaces like sweet A and sweet B. I have held on to those rooms. Wow. And just because the Lord told me to stand firm, his word says to test him. Yeah. I kept those rooms kind of as a test and, and not a booger test, you know, like, Lord. Right. If he tells me to give up the rooms, I'll do it. But sure. I just want to thank you for your word. And Hallelujah. And yeah. Him. You know, that's something because a lot of people, they, they want God to just pour it on. Uh, but so, how many understand that, he, you know, he will he will instruct you if if he knows that stuff stuff is coming on the earth sometimes he'll instruct he'll instruct you on how to get through it now sometimes when stuff has been coming i say lord is there you know any any problem you go no we went right through 2008 2009 all that that stuff that happened in the economy we just it never touched us we just sailed right through it never it would never even dip down uh, other times, like uh, during that time, uh, two years ago, the Lord said, recession is coming. We didn't know it was going to be through pandemic, but he said, recession is coming or, or a squeeze is coming and you need to set aside some money. So we started to set aside some money and we just we just sailed right through it. Never felt we never felt any financial squeeze because we'd already been we'd already been heeding the word of the Lord before. How many understand that he knows this stuff is coming and he'll work with you. But how many know you got you, there's you just can't do it the way you did it 20 years ago or you can't do it the way the last time you did it. You got to listen to him and go with him with whatever the strategy is for that time. And so what she's testifying is, listen, my business is still around because the word of the Lord came at the strategic time and, and, and she heeded it. How many understand that some people didn't heed it and probably suffer the consequences? But that wasn't because God didn't provide the instruction ahead of time. Smile like we're not talking about you, okay? <laughs> Anybody else have a testimony? I'm gonna, I'm, yes, yes. We're, gonna, we're running him around. So Sunday night, um, I came up for healing, mm -hmm. and I ended up getting healing in my soul more so than in my body, although the pain in my body is now gone too. Praise but God. But the healing in my soul that took place was something that the Lord's been talking to me about for a while now, but I have not been able to bring myself to a place to get vulnerable enough with him to allow him to heal me. And so it's been a process. It wasn't an instantaneous as soon as I hit the floor. That was just like the opening of the wound. Mm. And then he just continued to pour his love out on me. And um, one of the things that he told me for these meetings is I was going to try and work. And he told me, no, I don't want you to work. I want you to trust me. And I want you to just stay in prayer and just focus on what's going on now. Mm. And so when you gave the word about if we knew what kind of time we we're in right now we would be more respectful with our time and so that's again heeding the word of the lord and saying okay mm -hmm. this is what i need to be focusing on and so it's been wonderful because with all the processing i haven't even been able to sleep and so i came and met with my pastor this morning and he's he's like you need to sleep <laughs> you need to go <laughs> home and you need to sleep and he's like lord give her good sleep and you know what i went home and i slept like a rock <laughs> and then when i got up i was on my way here and just all of a sudden i could feel i was just meditated and thinking about you know how good god was and i could feel that hole open up 
And the more that I yielded, at first I was resisting, but the Lord's like, no, I want you to yield that to me. And the more I yielded, it was like he was pulling things out. Mm. And it felt like the more he pulled out, the faster it got and the faster that hole was closing wow. and becoming sealed. Wow. And so that was interesting because I've had him heal me before where I open it up and it's just gone. Mm-hmm. But right. this was different. This yeah. was completely different. And it was amazing. Probably much deeper as well. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. That is really, thank you for sharing that. I, I know that that's a vulnerable uh, position to put you in, but thank you for saying that because that's, that's, a very, that's a very touching thing because not everybody would be willing to open up in that capacity just to say, hey, listen, I've been dealing with some stuff that I just couldn't get over and God's, God's healing all that, you know, and I uh, appreciate that. That's very, that's very kind, very generous of you. Anybody else you got testimony? Yes. All right, I know I already know part of your testimony, but I want everybody else to hear this. This is really fun. This is this is good. Um, I'm starting to hear out of my left ear um, for the first time in 12 years. Yeah, and, thank you, Jesus. Um, and I say starting because I know God has begun a healing work, and He will complete it. Uh-huh. And um, you also called out um, headaches and migraines. Um, I don't have headaches or migraines, but then you said, or whatever. I have whatever. I've Mm. had, had, um, since 2007, really intense pressure in my head. And doctors couldn't attribute it to anything. Um, And sometimes I would push through it. Some days it's too debilitating. It wouldn't work. Um, And over the last month, Um, Just through more prayer and changing some things in my diet, it was starting to lessen, but I was still having, you know, these days. Um, Last night, the Lord touched me. Mm -hmm. Um, The power touched me. Yeah. And today was the first clear day I have had since 2007. Wow. 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 That is as big as deaf ears opening. I mean, that is, that's awesome. That's awesome. I love hearing that. I love hearing that. But I Anybody? did tell you I have a new condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell, yeah. The, new, tell, tell the new condition. So we need, we have. something that, that started today, and it's that this ear is sore because I keep pushing on it to listen with this ear. <laughs> <laughs> that's a self-inflicted, uh, that's a self-affliction. It's not, it's, it's, not a de- it's not a devil, and it's not a condition. It's just finger in the ear problem. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, come here. I, I want I want you to I want you to come here and testify, young man. Hallelujah. Let's give this guy a microphone. Hallelujah. I want you to testify what the Lord did for you last night. This was a this was powerful. So last night I was praising and before we I we I had come to church. I had had I had constipation and I on the way there I also felt car sick and I during praise I was praising and I just it, I didn't feel it until clo- near the end I I noticed that I w- I didn't hurt anymore so I God had healed me, and I... During I, your praising? During my praise. Yeah. I had not known it, and now that I I feel so much better, it, I couldn't be, used to be touched near my stomach, and now I can... I, I feel so much better. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I'll take one more. One, one more testimony. Anybody got... Uh, any, Anybody else got testimony? So the Lord's not done anything else for anybody else other than these people. All right, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just messing around. Okay. Um, Some of you know and some of you don't that my left arm and neck area and shoulder have given me problems off and on. Well, I had broken my wrist 
right after we moved into our house at the beginning of the year. And it w made the essential tremors even worse in my hand. They're still yet to come under uh, the authority of Jesus and the Suicide Squad and my faith about that. I was doing physical therapy, and my therapist realized that my left shoulder was frozen. And my cervical vertebrae were giving me a lot of problems. So the therapist and I decided we were going to take a, a period of me being off, not going to anything. And I just got a steroid shot for my cervical well, at C7 and C1 point um, to try to calm down the event area. So I just went back on Monday to the therapist again to get some measurements. Almost all of the measurements are greater than they were when I left the hospital. Whoa. And my, my frozen shoulder is got a better range of motion than it did then. So, and I was standing, I was sitting here standing and thinking about what you were talking about, healing, and also about two more 101 scriptures. Mm -hmm. I have them printed out. I read them through every day if I don't forget. And then I've highlighted certain ones that jumped out at me. Right. And I read those right after I read the full set. Yeah. Along with my devotional and some other things I do. And I have three people now that I have copies of them and a highlighter and an envelope that I'm sending to them. And I kept thinking, and I don't know that they're have to correct more and make the words better. I don't know if they're trying to tell me that I'm going to be doing more of sending out these scriptures and talking Maybe to so. about yeah. healing. I don't know, but she's going to have to make that call. Yeah, yeah, sure. Of course. Isn't that wonderful? You've got better range of motion, better, better improvements. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Let's give the Lord a praise offering for all the stuff he's been doing. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff he's ha that's going on in this place. A lot of stuff has been going on this week. Hallelujah. That's, that's kind of why we have testimony services, because if, if you don't really know, you don't know maybe some of the lives that are, are in, how they're impacted. And when they get to testify, you kind of get to hear kind of the backstory of, of how it got and what God did for them. And so it, it's always fun. Now, now mo a lot of leaders and pastors... Nowadays, you know, I don't remember probably the last time I heard singing in the spirit among the congregation. And I've been, I've been, I only go to Pentecostal spirit filled churches and they don't hardly ever sing in the spirit anymore. Uh, they don't ever have, I, I haven't gone to where they've had testimony services. They don't, and you know why? Is it because they don't know how to handle some people that go on and on and on and on, or they don't know how to handle uh, somebody that doesn't really say it the right way or whatever, you know? And so, and so, a lot of times they just avoid testimony services altogether. And and here's the deal: if you're well taught as a culture, you don't have to worry about it because it's self-correcting. But the deal is, is that so many guys, you know, well, we don't want it. We don't want that said because we don't want people to think, well, who cares people, what people think? Is that why we're in the ministry? Really? Wow. Okay. So, but I always, I'm always grateful for testimony meetings and I, I love hearing the stories because you know what, for one thing, I, I don't even know all of the stuff. So when I get to hear it, I get to hear, I didn't know about the pressure in your head on top of all the other stuff that you're going, what's going on and all the other stories. And, and, and sometimes people come to me personally and they said, you know, Hey, blah, 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 you know, and I'm like, Oh, that's wonderful. But if you catch me after service, I'm still buzzing. And so you can tell me the story. Remember I told you that story? Uh, no. I, you know, when you're into the anointing and we're in, this, in the spirit, you know, you're not totally cognizant. You're not totally coherent. 
you're not in the intellectual realm. And if it was in the, and there's sometimes I use that excuse at home with my wife and she doesn't, you know, believe me. I, I've been watching, I've been watching TV. Yeah, but football doesn't put you in the spirit, you know. Well, yeah, it does. It's, it's not the Holy Spirit, but. <laughs> but the dogs beat Ohio State, you know. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, that's Jesus working on my behalf, you know. <laughs> it, yeah, it was a miracle, <laughs> you know. Um, so anyway, there's some stuff back at the table. I'm gonna, uh, we're going to get into it. How many came to hear the Word of God tonight? How many are ready to hear the Word of God? Uh, I want you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to, uh, well, where should we turn? I, we're not, we did get to John 5, by the way. We did accomplish the mission and got to John 5. Uh, last night and if you don't remember i'm sorry you have to get this the youtube video or the cd or whatever they make available nowadays um but i do want you to go to um hebrews chapter 11 hebrews chapter 11 and we're going to be we're because this tuesday night we're we're we're, we're addressing more of the explorations and we're going to take a little bit of a just kind of a just a slight side journey but while you're finding hebrews chapter 11 there's some stuff back there so one of the things that the explore nations is is studying right now and what the subject is is the subject of faith this is the abc's when when i go to churches that are not strong on word not and there's no church that ever says oh we're just not strong in the word they all think they're strong in the word until life happens to them and when they start retreating to natural responses or natural options guys how many understand believers have a different set of options open to them for responding to things that happen in life. Life happens to everybody. Life happens to everybody. But we have alternate responses that are given to us that the world does not have. We don't have to respond the same way the world responds. Now, you remember what Jesus said? He said, the man that hears my words and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Remember that? Yes. And when the wind, the rain, the flood came, his house stood. But the man that hears my words and does not do them, I will liken him to a foolish man that built his house on the sand. And the same rain, flood, storm, all that, the same thing happened to the man that built his house on sand is the same thing that happened. How many understand that Christians do not have all the devil's attention? What? There are some people, and if you get to, if you get to some people, you, you think that they think that they have all of the devil's attention. Well, you're not really that important. There, everybody has terrible things that happen to them in life. Now, here's the deal. Everybody has this happen. But believers who are grounded in the word have an alternate response than just people in the natural they should if they're taught right. Now, that's where it shows up whether they're word people or whether they're just people. And that's a big difference. So faith is one of those things that we talk about faith in this particular thing. And, and this is getting you rooted in faith, not in feeling. This is getting helping you to understand what faith is. This is the... ABCs, the substructure, it's the foundation, it's the, it's, the, it's the ground floor of what faith is, all right? So it will help you, get you established, and there are six messages in here on this, I think on these particular ones, on the, on the USBs, uh, you, we have the outlines that, that go along with it, we have both the master uh, outline as well as the ones that are, have the blanks in them so you can actually conduct your Bible study and we, we give you the material to do so. Anybody? Now here, I feel really generous tonight. Is it okay? Because it's Exploration Night. And so, everybody's got their hands up like it. I feel generous in the sense that I want to give a 20% discount on everything. 
I, I, I'm going to take $5 off of everything. Everything on the table tonight is 20 bucks. All right. If you got a 20, we got something for you. And there's enough material out there. There's enough material out there that somebody can get something uh, that will help you. I promise you it'll be worth, if you'll pay attention to the material on there, it'll be worth more than 20 bucks. I promise you that. All right. I'll, I, did you want this one? Not you. Huh? The one behind you. She, you didn't even raise your hand. Just make sure it gets all the way there. All right. Good. <laughs> uh, there's uh, one, the only, you know, I've been, uh, <laughs> I've been accused of a lot of things, but I've been accused of being a money guy. I've been accused of being a money guy. Oh, he's, that's yeah, one of those money guys. Yeah, okay, I'm a money guy. But here's what I believe. I believe that, I believe that God has a response to your generosity. And I, the only thing that's on my table that has to do with money is what you do after you give. Not squeezing you to give or squeezing you to give more or to become a subscriber or to become a partner. That's, that's between you and the Lord. That's not any of my business. Whatever it is that you do for this ministry or whatever you do for any other ministry, that's between you and the Lord. That's, not, that's nobody's business. No one can tell you. Now, we can invite you. We can talk about it. But I don't have anything on my table that does that. I only tell you what to do once you've actually given. The only thing on my table is, is that the, it's called the principles of reaping. It's not the principles of sowing. It's the principles of reaping. There's a lot of people that here's what they do. They give their offering and then they forget it. And they just think, hope that, well, you know, because I've given, you know, it should just come back to me automatically. Is that what the farmer does? Sow seed and then goes back in his house and, well, you know, if it's, if it's really a harvest, it'll just get in the barn. But, but there's a, there are things to do after you give that will help you reap. It will help, it will help you to understand. And I promise you, if you get this for 20 bucks, I promise you, you're going to get a lot more than 20 bucks worth out of this if you'll heed the, the material that's on there. All right. And then we talked last night about uh, maintaining a heart for God, uh, being passionate. And one of the things that we talk about, uh, one of the things that I love is uh, the hunger for God. If you've never read A.W. Tozer's, uh, um, which one is it? The, uh, uh, his hunger for God. I mean, I, you know, it, it, it's it, the, the, the title escapes me, but but. Tozer has some amazing material on the hunger for God. Well, I came up with something. How much of God do you want? This is not teaching. This is preaching. So if you never heard me preach before, this is preaching. And the first one is Moses, the man for whom power was not enough. Nobody had more miracles other than Jesus. Nobody had more miracles than Moses. But he said, Lord. I don't care about all these miracles. Show me your glory. <laughs> Second one's David, the man for whom position was not enough. He was the shepherd boy that got made king. He said, you know what I'm going to do with my position? I'm going to bring the Ark of the Covenant back. I, I don't care about this kingship. I want. And the thing about it is, is that he, he brought the Ark of the Covenant back, but he didn't put it down in the temple where it belonged. He put it up. He put, th he put three stakes in a, and he put a tent around up where he, um, on Mount Moriah so he could sing songs in the presence of God. He wanted to be in the presence. It was supposed to be down in that temple, but he wanted it up there. So he could just ha hang out with God. Because his, his, he used his position to know God. Uh, third one, Peter, uh, the man for whom prosperity was not enough. I mean, they just had a massive haul, two, uh, two boats sinking massive haul. And God says, you know what? If you follow me, I'll make you fishers or men. And they walked away from that business and, went right, and, and, and followed him. I don't know about you, but I'd rather follow Jesus than follow money. 
And the last one is Paul, the man for whom prestige was not a, he had, he has in one place in Romans, he's, he said, you know what, here's my pedigree. And he starts naming off what he is. I'm a Jew of the Jews, born on the eighth day, you know, or born, born a Jew, the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day, trained in the best of the schools. I mean, he was the, he was the role model, the prime example of all the things that you could acquire through man's attempts, through education, through affluence and all that. He said, he said, you know what? But prestige is not enough. Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He said, I don't care about all that stuff. I just want to know him. I don't know about you, but that's one of those things that, that just kind of it keep you want to keep that. You want to keep this one on the front burner. Because even when you don't know all the other doctrine stuff, this, the hunger will kind of keep you straightened out. Even when you don't get everything else right, just right, that hunger will keep you, that, keep you pointed in the right direction. Does that make sense? You, 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 how many understand you're going to make mistakes along the way? Anybody not make, made a mistake? If you raise your hand, you just did. <laughs> I got one in the back that's professing to do with it, but I think I'm going to cast out the spirit of lying. Uh, <laughs> I'm picking on you, Lisa Carroll. Uh, <laughs> but, but listen, you're going to make mistakes along the way. And there are going to be some people that they're going to see you make mistakes and they're going to get upset with you or they're going to discount you. But God will never discount you as long as you're pointed in the right direction, as long as you keep your hunger after him. Amen. Has the slowest person found in Hebrews 11 yet? <laughs> so, you raised your hand. You're not the slowest person. All right. So here's the deal. We're going to talk a little bit about faith tonight. And we're, we're going to, guys, remember last night it, during in some of the message, I, I, mentions, uh, I mentioned this, that uh, on Bible subjects, listen real carefully, on Bible subjects, there is the macro version or what some macro version or the macro version, or there's the micro version. In other words, you, you, you have to some and sometimes preachers don't tell you what, what vantage point they're, they can be talking about. I watch some guys and they're so, they're talking about one specific thing so detailed that by trying to emphasize that one detail, they lose sight of the macro or the macro. They lose sight and they'll say things in that detail that can't fit in the macro. That makes sense. Faith is a big subject. Healing's a big subject. There's a lot of things that, 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 that coincide in the macro version of Bible subjects. Grace is another one of those massive, su great subject, m wonderful subject. Sanctification is another one. Resurrection, judgments, baptism, lots of different kinds. But if you only emphasize, you get down to the details, and the more you emphasize and roll over a, a detail, the more all of a sudden that detail becomes bigger than really what it was supposed to do in the macro version. Does that make sense? If we start making, if we stay, start making molehills into mountains, that's where we start deviating doctrine. And all of a sudden the whole macro version of it begins to shift. And that's why we have over 33,000 denominations in this country, in this country. And there's over 10,000 just in the Baptists. I, in all honesty, we, we, because we, we, because we don't, dis we disagree on one scripture, we're going to start a new denomination. Well, that's taking a detail and making it macro. That makes sense. So we're going to talk about the macro version of faith. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the, the, the foundation of faith and the macro version. So especially you explore nation students, you should be taking notes here. So we're going to talk about the macro version, and then we're going to work on a, just a couple of those, uh, just a couple of those points in in more, a little more detail. We're going to zoom in on some of that. So we're going to talk about the ABCs of faith. What are the ABCs of faith? What are the ABCs of faith? The ABC number one, the number one. What's what's A? What's A is why faith? Why faith? Why faith? Some people say, well, no, 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 it's what faith is. No, you got to know what, why faith before you know what faith is. Why would you even need faith? What's the, per why, why is it that we need faith? 
What's the, what's the Bible say? Why do we need faith? What's the important? Yeah, I know, I know you, you are in Hebrews eleven six. I know you know that part. We're going to get to that. It's my sermon. Just let me get, let me take it at my pace here. Letter B, letter B, what faith is. So the ABCs, I'm going to give you the macro version of it, and then we're going back, we'll go back to why faith, okay? So macro version, letter B is what faith is. What is faith? What is faith? What, what is, what, what constitutes faith? And what do you, what is the Bible definition of faith? And we're not talking about faith in the sense of the way humans or, or, or religion uses faith in the sense, what faith are you? Hindu, you know, Muslim, that, that's your faith. No, 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 no. This, we're talking what the Bible says about faith. Okay. Letter C is how faith comes. So if I define if I define what it is, B, then letter C, letter C, I need to know how to get it. I need to know how to obtain it. I need to know how it comes. All right. There's ways. And I know, I know some of you, you're already preaching my message. You're already trying to preach and fill in the gaps. All right. Letter D, letter D, faith must be released. Now, I know some of you say, yeah, I know how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yeah, it does. That's one way. But there are actually two ways that faith can come. I found a back door into faith. So anyway, uh, faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But that, that he, Romans chapter 10 verse 17 doesn't tell you what to do with it once you've got it. It just tells you how it comes. And that's where the majority of people miss it they think if i can just get it it'll make all the difference in the world i found out that that's where most people are have failed they've stopped the progress because they've never released what they've had what they have they may have it there's a lot more people that that have faith they just never they don't know what to do with it once they've got it so they just they're waiting on god they're, they say, well, now, God, I've, I've got faith now. Now you need to do your part. No, 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 no. You have to release faith. Letter D is faith must be released. Must be released. Letter E, faith must be fed. Letter E, faith must be fed. You need to feed your faith. All right? And there's all kinds of stuff about that. And letter F, the last one, this again, just the macro version. This is the maker. This again, this is just the foundational part of faith. So the last one is faith must be the leader. Faith must be the leader. Now, I know some of you probably haven't heard those last, the last two. But let me, let me just start, let me start off by saying this. God does not expect you to pay for what he promises. He only expects you to believe him for what he promises. If he promised you a Cadillac that is a money magnet, he doesn't expect you to pay for it. He expects you to believe for it. He doesn't expect you to pay for the house he expects you to believe for the house he doesn't expect you to he doesn't expect you to pay for the airplane he expects you to believe for the airplane i don't believe in these preachers having an airplane well you won't have one then that's 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 irrelevant you're not you're not another preacher's judge I don't believe that preachers should be rich. Well, okay. Should you? That's a question. Well, I, don't, I just don't believe in this being rich. All right, then quit your job. Well, I've got to work. Well, don't get paid then. Just tell them you're working and not, pay, and get, not get paid. Well, I got to eat. Well, then you're going to be rich. 
because there are a lot of people there that can't eat. I've been in a lot of countries where they, you know, I mean, a day's wages was basically putting meals on their table. I've been in countries where the entire, I mean, equivalent now was was eight dollars a day, the entire, and that's for journeyman wages, eight dollars a day. That's the, that's those guys that are trained to do. Eight bucks a day? Are you kidding me? Now here's the deal. God, God doesn't expect you to pay for it. God doesn't expect you to figure it all out. He just expects you to believe him for it. All right. So here's let's 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 settle this issue. I, I, I can tell it's just, yeah, I, I'm, I may I may have some of you your wheels turning here. So I, I want I want you to understand he does not expect you to figure it all out. I, I, I told uh, if you were here last night, we turned things off. I, I found I found that um, I found ways that, that God, if you'll walk with him, he'll lead you in places that you never thought possible. Never thought possible. George Mueller at the at, in the end at the end of the 1800s, he the Lord began dealing with him about having an orphanage there in England. In the 1800s, 1800, late 1800s. So he kept passing on his way to on, on his way to work. He kept passing by this house that looked like it was abandoned. And so he inquired about the house to see if you know who whose it was, because he thought maybe I could turn this house into uh, maybe a home, have a few kids, you know, because that's he's what he feels that the God's doing with him. And so he, it's it's a dilapidated house. And so. He finds out who the owner is and he tells the owner kind of what's on his heart to do that he wants to turn it into an orphanage for kids that, you know, because they had a lot of kids that were had been abandoned. And so so basically, he just, I mean, just, I think it was I think it was basically kind of given to him or very cheap. He acquired it for very little and he put and he got it all fixed up. He used all of his faith to, you know, that he could to believe God to get it fixed, you know, to, to get it fixed up. And then he got a couple kids in there. Well, when he got in there, then he didn't have any money. Matter of fact, it, he was sitting down. They were sitting down to dinner and there's no groceries. They sit down to dinner. And so he began to thank the Lord for the food that the Lord had. You said he would provide daily bread. And he began to. Th and about the time that he was praying for the food, a knock came at the door. And people left bags of groceries at the door. Now, he started that way. That's the way he started. Now, at the end of his ministry, at the end of his ministry, he said this. He said, after daily feeding my faith and exercising my faith for 50 years. Now, he wound up having a complex in the early 1800, early 1900. He had a complex where he had 2,500 orphans that he was taking care of every single day and there was an assembly of god preacher that went over there one day went over there one time because he wanted to see kind of what what was what was going on because they were looking at it and so he said he said he was staying with brother Mueller, and so he said uh, brother Mueller said uh you know we need to pray because we don't have an we don't have a scrap of food for these kids in the morning for breakfast we need to pray and 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 the and the american preacher's like my my God, you don't have food for in the morning. What kind of place is this? You know, I mean, and so George Mueller just got down and very childlike. Lord, you know, we don't have food. So we just thank you for that. You'll you'll provide for it. We thank you for it in Jesus name. And, and so he just, and that was about all of the prayer he had. And, you know, and, and assembly God, Pentecostal preacher, he's like, well, if you really got that big of a need, you really ought to get after it. That's kind of a simple prayer. You know, for uh, for this kind of a need, you're going to feed 2,500 kids breakfast. And, you know, I mean, you really ought to get after it a little bit. And he said, no, he said, Brother, Brother Mueller, he just, you know, he said that little prayer. And then um, and, and you have to remember, they were getting up at four and five o'clock in the morning. So they go to bed at eight, eight thirty, nine o'clock. And so they, so so he went in. And so the assembly God preacher thought he could hardly sleep. He was worried about all those kids having breakfast. And he went in there and he checked, he checked on, on Brother Mueller and, and, and to see if he was up worrying about it. 
And sure enough, Brother Mueller's in there just sleeping away, not, not even. Not. <laughs> and so he's, he, he, he talked about how he got, he got kind of off to sleep about 2.30, 3 o'clock. And then all of a sudden, he was woken up about 4 in the morning. With these chains rattling, the gates opening, and, and, and these horses and wagons coming in. And, and, uh, and Farmer had, uh, had, had said, hey, you know, it, so Brother Mueller got up and, and this preacher got up and they went down. And, and this farmer had come in with four wagon loads of food. Four wagon loads of food. And, and so, the, so the preacher, he was kind of curious. He thought, did you, did you? Did someone contact you? Because remember, this is not this is before phones. Uh, this you know, this is before all the telecommunications and all all that. He said, "Now, did did someone you know tell you about this?" He goes, "No, no." He said, "No one turned an invoice to me." He says, As a "Matter of fact, I had gotten off to sleep, and the Lord woke me up, told me to make sure to have some food down here in the morning for these kids." About the same time. George Mueller's praying. The Lord woke him up. <laughs> Got him up. Had four wagon loads. Now, Brother Mueller. Now, I told you that story because I want you to understand. You know, we if we have a big need, we got to get after it. Because it's such a big. You know, God's not really moved by how big the need is. He's really not moved by the, how big the need is. You are. But he's not. And all he's asking you to do is believe. And Brother Mueller said, after 50 years of daily feeding my faith and exercising it daily, he said, it's as easy for me now to believe God for a million dollars. And a million dollars back then was a million dollars way more. He said, it's, easy, it's as easy for me to believe God for a million dollars as it was to believe God for the first dollar when I first started. Your faith can grow. Your faith can grow. Are you in Hebrews chapter 11 yet? The Bible says here, without faith, it is impossible. It is impossible to please God. So, why faith? Why faith? The number one reason why faith is that you're not going to be able to please God at all. I don't care how many times you go to church. I don't care how long you pray. I don't care how holy you live. I don't care what kind of alms you give to the poor. I don't care how much you take care of people, how much, how much love you may have. If you don't have faith, you're not going to be able to please God. Thank you for those three holy murmurs. But the deal is, is that you're, you're, you can't please God unless you have faith. Whatever you do, if you're worshiping, you better do it by faith. If you're going to, if you're going to pray, you better pray by faith. If you're going to live right, if you're going to, if you're going to go and preach in his name, you better do it by faith. Because if you're not, if you do anything, it has to be done with faith. Otherwise, you're not going to please him. You have no chance of pleasing him. Does it, does it say that without faith, it's difficult to please him? Does it say it's difficult? No, it says it's impossible. Uh, th it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, trying to enter a chocolate chip cookie contest. Anybody know how to make chocolate chip cookies in this church? Oh, I got a lot. Oh, I got, I got a bunch of people know how to make chocolate. What do I need to, what are the ingredients that I need to make chocolate chip cookies? Flour, salt, sugar, eggs, butter, brown sugar. Vanilla. Baking soda. I got, I got some pretty good cookies right now. But I'm not going to win a chocolate chip cookie contest without one specific ingredient. <laughs> Hershey's. <she's, laughs> now, we're now we're snobby about which chocolate chips we use. Ghirardelli. <laughs> yeah, now we're getting easy. We're starting to get a fight here. We, you know, 
Ghirardelli Lives Matter. Uh, you know. <laughs> careful, careful. <laughs> All right, listen, listen, listen. You cannot win a chocolate chip cookie contest without having some chocolate chips. Correct? And whether you give money or whether you're praying or whether you're living holy, you got to do it with the element and the ingredient of faith. If you're going to please God at all, if you have any hopes to please God, you have got to do it by faith. Back up from Hebrews 11 to Hebrews chapter 10. And the second, the, the second reason that why faith, why faith is the Bible says here in verse 38 of Hebrews chapter 10. Now the just shall live by faith. And if anyone, if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So if we are to, number two, we are to live by faith. So we are to please God with faith. Number two, we are to live by faith. All right. Let's go, let's go over to, uh, back over to Hebrews 11 and go down to the bottom, towards the bottom in verse 33. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33. So we are to please God with our faith. We are to live by faith. But I notice, I want you to notice um, verse 33. Verse 33. Yeah. Who through faith, through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises. Guys, you are not gonna you are not gonna obtain promises except through the avenue of faith. Why is faith important? Why is faith important? Because we please God with our faith. Why is faith important? Because we live by faith. Why why is faith important? Because through faith we can subdue kingdoms, work, work righteousness, and obtain promises. All of the promises of God are in him, yes, and amen, as far as he's concerned. As far as God's concerned, he's already, he's already, he's already rolled out the, the, his side of the contract, so to speak. He's already made his end of the bargain. But you're not going to be able to take advantage of that contract. You're not going to be able to take advantage of what he has offered you. Because grace offers... All of the promises of God, but all that grace offers is obtained by faith. Your salvation was an offer to forgive you, to expunge your record, to give you a new, uh, a new identity, to give you a new destiny, to give you a retirement plan that's out of this world. All of that contract, all of that hinged on by, through grace, by faith. Does that make sense? That promise, that redemption was obtained by faith. So we obtain promises. So we please God with our faith. We live by faith. We obtain promises by faith. Why faith? Well, let's go over here to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and notice in verse number 7. Anybody know what it says offhand? For, yeah, now you do. <laughs> For we walk by faith and not by sight. What's the difference between live and walk? Because the Bible says we are to live by faith, but here it says we are to walk by faith. Act, uh, someone said action. Uh, uh, how does that? Let's differentiate what what is what which one's action, which one's not action. Walking it would be action, as opposed to living would not be action. Help me out here. Oh, they're both action. You have people arguing with you now. Well, you better know your next step if you're walking. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But here's what. Walking. Watch this. Walking. Let me help you here. Walking is how you actually make decisions. 
Living is the value by which you make those decisions. To live by faith is to carry values that we will not bend our value system based upon the word of God. Based upon what we know and what we've developed by faith, we have a value system that a co we have a code of ethics that we have a value system with. Walking is the actual decision making process that has come out of that value system. Does that make sense? Does that help you differentiate the difference? That value system, I will not lie, because, not because it's immoral, immoral. I will not lie because God's word is based on truth. So my, my value is I will not lie. But when I get into a situation that it would be easy to lie, I walk out those values. I make the decision and my actions... And you are both right. You are both right. It is actions in the sense of my conduct. My conduct. I, my conduct is by faith. We walk by faith, not by. Why does he say sight? Why does he say sight? He says sight simply to differentiate. We walk by Faith out of our spirit, not by the senses of our body. I want you to write this down if, you, if you're taking notes, because here's the deal. Guys, when your hands, when hands are laid upon you, what's the first thing you check to see if you're healed? Your sight. You check your senses. <laughs> when it's time to... Bake the tithe check. What are you checking? <laughs> I'm checking my senses. Can I afford to do this? Right. But the, but, the, but the deal is, what's the check? Either I have to walk by faith based on the values I have set, or I have to, or I'm going to be ruled by sin. Baby Christians, guys, listen real carefully. Baby senses, baby Christians are always ruled by those senses. They struggle more and they, 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 dignify senses or logic they dignify senses or logic well you know god knows that i i can't afford this well well well, well god god must be god must be you know sending it you know media shipping because it's taking a long time he definitely didn't overnight it you see, you see are, you, are you tracking with me? Why faith? Because we walk by faith. Our conduct, our decision-making process, how we treat one another is based by faith. When I tell you I love you and there's nothing you can do about it, I mean it. Because the, the love that I have for you is not based upon your performance, good or bad. If I love you, it's based upon a decision that I and the way I see you or the way I see others. I have a decision making process. Even if people get ugly with me, I'm going to love them because how else could Jesus give us the command? Bless those that persecute you and even want to kill you. You need to bless them. I'm not, man, I'm unfriending them and blocking them. Why? My conduct is supposed to be. Now I realize there are some people that you don't want to bring close. Because of their conduct. But that just means. But that doesn't mean I don't love them anymore. I feel sorry for some people. How many understand that some people are stupid? <laughs> and you have to love them in their stupidity. How many know that there was times when you were stupid? Hello? If you don't have your hand raised, come on, somebody. How many have ever done stupid? You know, yeah, we've all been there. And how many are glad that our life was not defined by those stupid moments? Yeah. Ah, isn't that great? Now, here's the deal is that there are other people that they are in stupid right now. Don't look at them. Just say you just recognize that they are. 
No, they, they didn't show up on Tuesday night. Now, he, now, here's the deal. Is that, guys, listen real carefully. There are people that are in stupid condition. They don't even know how stupid they are. Because you didn't know how stupid you were. I didn't know how stupid I was. I thought I was right in my stupidity. You didn't know you are going to get cussed at, did you? <laughs> stupid. <laughs> No, no, the deal is, is that none of us knew how stupid we were. We thought we were right. We were justified in our stupidity. And thank God somebody loved us out of our stupidity. And if nobody on earth did, God did. <laughs> now, here's the deal. Is that that same love that God has, he put on the inside of you. And you, by faith, are going to have to love others. By faith, not because of performance, because sometimes people say stuff that can get ugly. There are things that people will do that will hurt you. There are things that will do where they will abandon you, reject you. They will, they'll say some terrible things. They will injure you. And what you choose to do in that moment will define whether you're walking by faith or whether you're walking by senses. Either you're justified in your senses to get a, and take revenge and hold and hold unforgiveness against them and and just and be bitter and and uh, and and hurt and and crawl into the hole, or you can say, "No, I choose to love," because love always wins. And I, I've told you many times that Taylor love wasn't that big. My family love, my family, it was like, you do us, we'll do you one more before the inconvenience of being done. We're not going to take revenge and extract, but because of the inconvenience of having to mess with your silly self, we're going to one-up you. Well, I had to get rid of that. At the very early stages of my development in ministry, I had to get rid of that stuff. I didn't realize that preachers could do stupid while being in the ministry. All honesty, my, my biggest injury was, was my first and foremost vulnerable, where I was vulnerable was from a preacher. I, he told me that I wasn't called, told me that I, the best thing I could do is get out, of, get out of Bible college. This is where the healing power showed up in Buxton. It was that pastor. It was that pastor. I wrote it back because I said I, I was thinking about coming back for, coming back for Christmas. And I'd like to know if I, it was such a wonderful service. I thought we had a wonderful service. I thought we really had a great service. People getting healed. People getting filled with the spirit. Four people getting saved. I got healing power. Whoa, dude, guy. You know, I'm thinking, man, it was wonderful. So I wrote him back. I, it's when we used to write letters. Remember when we used to write letters? I wrote him a letter and sent it to him. And, and this was 1985. Uh, yeah, 1985. And I wrote him a letter said, uh, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about coming back home for, for Christmas break. Would you be interested in having me for uh, a, a service? Well, I didn't have enough money to get home. My mom and dad didn't have enough money to get me home. And so I stayed in Tulsa and worked. But all my friends that were in Tulsa that were hanging out, they went home. So I'm alone. In Tulsa by myself, and the Saturday before Christmas, I get his letter. And I thought, well, I need something encouraging. <laughs> and it was the bomb from hell. <laughs> he said, I don't know what you, you've done more damage in my church than any one minister has ever done. He said, the best thing that you could do is get out of Bible college. You're not called. And the best thing you do, get out of Bible college, quit the ministry because, because I, we don't, I don't want you to hurt anybody else. Well, I, didn't, I know he's a liar, but I didn't know that it was showing up through the preacher. I, because my, you know, because the way we were taught is Father, Son, the Holy Ghost preachers. Preachers wouldn't do that kind of stuff. And I didn't realize, I found out later that it was because he, he was upset because he was forced off of the evangelistic field into this pastorate because he couldn't get enough meetings. And he had at one time had a healing ministry, but he had go, it had went dormant in his life through his disobedience. And here comes this 19-year-old punk in his church has this meeting 
So he's going to lash out all of his bitterness towards me. I will tell you in that moment, that was one of the darkest moments of my entire life. I sat for four hours wondering which way I'm going to take my life. It's the only time I've ever thought that. Only time I've ever battled that. But I thought, well, if I had, I had prophecies, I had visions as a kid. I've, I've, I told the Lord, I'll go anywhere, do anything. I have positioned myself in Bible. I'm in my second year of Bible college. I'm, I, I'm, this is where I've chosen to go. And now it's all for nothing. All of my hopes, all of my dreams, all of my aspirations were based upon the information that was given to me that I had determined was by God. And now through one letter, it totally ripped me off of that foundation. And now what use is my life? So if there's no use for my life, I might as well just go ahead and check out. And I was, I was fully, I was, I was fully committed to it. And then, so, so that I, about after a few, you know, after that four hours, I kind of shook myself. And I said, wait, 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 wait. I, I may not be called, but I, I you know, because I started doubting everything at that point. I mean, I was doubting the integrity of the Bible. I was, I was doubting Christianity. I was doubting, the, is there a spiritual realm? Is there God? Or all that stuff. Because when, I mean, when you start, when you start spiraling down that way, I mean, it, it just goes right down the hole real quick. Listen real carefully. And my whole world collapsed at that point. In my mind. But then I, I, I snapped out of it. Wait, 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 wait. I, I've watched the Bible work too many times. Even at that age, I knew I'd watch my mom and dad, you know, stand on faith, believe God. And I watched that. I've watched it work. I knew that. I knew there's a God. I, I talked to him. He talked to me. I knew there was a spiritual realm. I'd had experiences where I had been there. I mean, I had some, I could tell you some experiences that I knew there was a spiritual realm. I been there. But that thing that was the nagging thing is, well, Jeff, you're not called. And I finished my I finished from from Christmas or New Year's of, of that of that year all the way into May. I was at Rama that last five months. I graduated Bible college doubting the call of God in my life. Because that one I could I didn't shake for a while. Matter of fact, I listened, I I still prayed, I I still talked to God. He told me to go out to California. Went out to California. He said, they're going to ask you to be the youth pastor, I want you to do it. I said, why? He said, you can at least serve me there. I said, oh, okay, I can do that. But you see, I started serving, and and I, I, I was doing the ministry, and you can't go very long, and all of a sudden, you got to know whether you're called or not. You get into ministry... You better figure out real, you'll find out real quick. You better do, is this vocation is not going to do it. You either better, you better have been called and anointed and appointed, or you better get out of the way. So I went back to homecoming. That was, that I graduated and took a position in, in uh, Los Angeles in Bellflower, California in June of 86. Started the full-time ministry in June of 86, June 1 of 86. And um, by October, I had planned to go back, back to homecoming. Went back to homecoming in October, back to Tulsa. And I told the Lord getting on the plane, if you don't talk to me about this call and settle this call thing, I'm done. I'm going to come back and I'm resigning and I'm going to go get a job and I'm going to, I'm, I'll just, I'll be a good Christian. I'll go, I'll go to chiropractic school. I'll go, or I'll go to doctor school. I'll do, I'll go get a job somewhere and I'll just go into business, but I'm not, I'm not staying in the ministry. I, you know, unless you said, so I thought, I thought for sure that Kenneth E. Hagan was going to call me out during that homecoming and say, the Lord has called you. And, you know, cause I was looking for, some, and I, I was, I, all these preachers and nobody, nobody has a prophecy for me. I'm looking for somebody to confirm this thing. 
Somebody confirm me. Do you not know that I'm hurting? No, I didn't. Well, I didn't tell anybody that. I didn't say it because I, uh, I, I didn't want it to be something derived or contrived. I, don't, I didn't want that. I wanted the real deal. How many would like the real deal? I want the real deal. And so I, 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 I don't know why I'm on this. I do know why I'm on it. But I got, it, I got on that. I got on, I got on that. Here I am. I'm, I get there Monday. He's not even call, talking about the call of God. Tuesday. When I got a, 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 thir, Thursday's the last day. Friday, I'm going home. Wednesday, come. No, nothing. Thursday, nothing. I go back to my room. I go back to the place where I stay. And I said, all right, Lord. I'm going, I'm going, when I go home, I'm, 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 I'm quitting. I'm telling him I can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm out. When I did that, the Lord Jesus himself showed up in that room. And that was the turning point for me. And that in that apartment room where, where, where my friends were, the Lord Jesus confirmed the call of God on me. Talked to me about my ministry for a good while. Not only have I never doubted it ever again, never doubted the call, but I realized that I am not like everybody else. I spent the first year or two. I spent. I spent. I was the schizophrenic preacher when I first started. Because I was Mario Murillo, R. W. Shambach, Kenneth E. Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, and uh, one other, Dwight Thompson. I trying to beat all of them, in, and some of them I could be in the. I could be all of them in one sermon. Y'all, uh, some of you don't even know who some of those people are, but, but I, I was all these other preachers because I was trying to have the same impact on others the way those men had had an impact on me. I did it out of, I did it out of, out of, um, purity of heart. I wasn't just trying to mimic them. I wanted to have the same impact on others that they had had on me. And the Lord said, would you stop all that? I said, Lord, I don't know how to stop all that. He said, you just be you. I said, I don't like me. <laughs> I don't find value with me. I don't find the value because I'm, I'm living by the senses. I'm living by what I think. And when the call of God, when the call of God settled in, there have been times where it's where they where people have tried to shake me on that again. They call me all kinds of stuff sometimes. But you know what? I don't I, call me all you want to. Just make sure you call me for dinner. <laughs> Cuz the deal is, here's the deal. I already settled this. And nobody can unsettle it from me. And it doesn't matter if I don't get any more invitations. I'm going to preach on the sidewalk. And you know, during COVID, there you know, my meetings were reduced cuz everybody's, you know, stopped having, you know, in, you know, church meetings and stuff, stuff. So I said, you know, anybody that calls me, I just just I just tell them I said, "Now, you know, you're susceptible to a sermon because usually I preach at least 200 times a year and I haven't preached 200 times a year, so you may get a sermon while you're on the phone with me." And so I just, I just preach to people on the phone, salespeople. <laughs> oh, you're selling insurance. I got insurance that you need to know about. I'm going to sell you some insurance. <laughs> I did. I just, I just started. You're still working during this COVID. Well, I want you to know I'm working right now. <laughs> Didn't get many offerings out of that. Did you get a couple discounts? But anyway. Does that help anybody? You better determine that between you and God. What is that? That is a settling of faith. All right. What are we on? Are we on four? We got four down. Walk by faith. That was the last one. Four. Number five. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter six. Uh, I, I want you to see this one uh, this way. 
Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give that to me again after I do this. Give that to me again after I do that. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. How many, are, how many are familiar with the, with the armor of God? How many of you? Well, this was one of the first, you know, lessons I, before I ever went to Ramah, I, was, I, I, I ministered on the armor of God. Just, that, that just gave me six things to talk about, that just to take up time, you know. But here's the deal is, he says here in verse 16, above all. Everybody say above all. Above all. Above all. Now, notice what he says. Taking the shield of faith. Watch this. We're clothed with other things, but he says, you have to take this. You're clothed with the belt. You're clothed with the breastplate. You're clothed with the shoes. You're, 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 but you have to take this. Taking, so you, guys, God's not going to shove the shield of faith into your hand. Let me say it again. God is not going to shove the shield of faith into your hand. You have to take it. You, it's your responsibility to take it. It's your responsibility to take faith. God is not going to force faith into you. He's going to, he's going to let you take it. And if you don't have faith, it's not because he didn't give it. It's because you didn't take it. He says, above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, why is it important to take the shield of faith? According to this verse, why is it important? So you can, so that you will be able, with which you'll be able to quench a few of the fiery darts of the wicked one. Most of the fiery darts. You know what the Greek word for all is? Yeah, you've been, you've, you've been in my meeting before. Or you have the same, we have the same, we have the same jokes. Uh, all, <laughs> all, <laughs> all the fiery darts. Question. What are fiery darts? Because here's what, here's what people think. Uh, be careful. Be careful. Watch this. Because he's a uh, uh, trials, temptations, storms, the refrigerator breaking down, the car getting hit. That's not the, that's not the fiery dart. That's not the fiery dart. That's not the fiery dart. That's life. It's. Fiery darts are thoughts. Fiery darts are thoughts. This whole thing got started, that sin thing got started on a thought. It's not the flat tire, it's what's being told to you when you get the flat tire. It's not the refrigerator breaking down. It's what's being told to you when you get, when you, when the refrigerator breaks down. It's not that pain. It's what's being told to you that that pain actually represents. It's not, it's not your struggle. It's what's being told to you in the struggle. That's the negotiation is that this, he's offering, the devil's always offering these thoughts. Those are fiery darts that he's trying to do. And those darts are coming at your mind on a way to reason these things out or as to why it's happening, how to get out of it. And this is what, why am I, why am I experiencing this? Why did, why did God allow this? Why did, why doesn't he do something? Why did, and all those fiery darts are coming at you to try to disrupt your relationship with God. All these fiery darts are is to separate you and to make God separated from you and reduce your value. Every one of the fiery darts that comes at you is to tell you what you're not or to tell you what God isn't. To separate you from his value and to reduce yours. Isn't that what happened in the garden? Isn't that what happened in the garden? God left something off. He, he, you're, you're, you, you weren't, you're not made complete. He, 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 he lost, you're, you're deformed. You, you should have had this knowledge of good and evil, but he put this garden, he put this tree in the garden, you know, so that you, so that you wouldn't be like him. He told you to leave it alone so you wouldn't be like him. They are already like him. Made in his likeness and image. 
but he deceived them into who they're not. That's what's going on today in our culture. Is people are believing that God somehow made a mistake with them. He made them the wrong sex. He made them the wrong orientation. He made them, he made them because I was born this way. Well, that's why you're supposed to be born again. If you're born again, there are no spiritually deformed Christians. You got all the ten toes and ten fingers that Jesus does. You got the two eyes and two ears that Jesus does. You look just like him in the spirit. Does that make sense? Fiery darts. Guys, the reason that you, the reason why faith, why faith, why do we take the shield of faith? It's so that we can protect ourselves. God doesn't protect us in this sense. You are to protect yourself with thoughts. You are to protect your thoughts. You're always going to be poor. You're always going to be this. You're always going to be broken. You're always going to be the victim. You're always going to be, you're all, you're never going to be able to break the cycle. You're never going to be, no, 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 no. My Bible says, my God shall supply. My God has blessed me with all spiritual blessing. My God has given me exceedingly precious promises that by us we can partake of a divine nature. My nature is not my own anymore. It's divine. I didn't do it. He liked me. He couldn't help himself. He searched for me. He sought me out. He gave his son for me because he couldn't spend eternity without me. He loved me that much. And now you want to wonder if he's going to heal you? What? Let's scramble that tapioca brain. Now, here's the deal. We are to protect ourselves. We have the responsibility to protect ourselves by our faith. You cannot take this shield by accident. You cannot take this shield because your best friend has it. You can't take it because of association. If the shield is not in your hands, it's no one's fault but your own. Yeah, 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 that's it. Thank you. He brought it back to me. <sighs> Was that, is that five? Is that five? There's another, there's another one. The Bible says, by faith, we overcome this world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. How are you going to handle the stuff that's going on in the world right now? It doesn't seem fair. It seems like we don't have, it seems like our, our, our rights are diminishing. Sorry, not mine. Not mine. Right. I'm not of this world. I'm a citizen of the United States, but I'm not of it. I'm not of this world. I have a covenant that's out of this world that gives me uh, rights, inalienable rights to believe him even if I'm in prison. And if you mess with me, we'll get to praising and he'll bust the jail wide out. I mean, he'll just bust it open. And all the bands and all the bonds, the, cuff, the, 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 the cuffs will just, just fall off. Because when you start praising the way he does earthquakes, it's the wildest earthquakes. Bonds start coming off of preacher's legs and... And doors start swinging open, and that's just because they're that's just because they're singing. Don't get preachers singing. We overcome this world by our faith. Does this make sense? All right. Hallelujah. We have the responsibility to. This is the why faith. If you don't, if you don't study these six things. You're go when you start studying the B, C, D, and E's, it's going to be like, well, you know, this is all methodology or it's all, it, it's all, you know, protocols and processes and all that stuff. If you don't understand the why's, guys, if you understand the why, you can, you can endure the rest of it. Does this make sense? Yeah. 
when you understand why I, I need to believe, and we talked about last night how that you can, it's possible to, it's possible to be healed and be ignorant, but the only way the ignorant are going to be healed is through gifts of the Holy Ghost. If you're going to be healed by faith, you got to know something. You got to know something. So why is it important to get in the Bible so that I know where God stands? Because if I know where God stands on the situation, if I begin to agree with him, regardless of what I see and feel and whatever, whatever it is that I can, whatever it is that's on this world, on this earth, I can start seeing my life change on the basis of his goodness, not on the basis of my compliance. Does that make sense? It's not about me being able to say it just the right way or have my hold my hand just the right way or do or attend just the right services or get in the right just the right meeting. It's about knowing him because the more I know him, the more he just changes me. The more I see him and the more I know about him, the more I just go, well. That 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 can't hang, that can't hang on me. And, and, and my mom and dad raised me to be a certain way, but uh my God shall supply all my need. I, I don't have to deal with that. I start seeing the world differently. In all honesty, I, I, we were raised poor. I mean, now we weren't we're as poor as some people. I mean, we at least had indoor plumbing. But we were poor. And we were raised. And, and you know, sometimes when you're, when you're raised in the, well, we can't afford that. Well, we can't afford that. You start looking at life. Well, well we can't afford it. And all of a sudden, it's, it, you look th at the world through the lens of, I can't afford it. And if I can't make enough money. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, please write this down if you're taking notes. Your value in this life, your value in this life, in this world system, your value in life is determined by either the problems you solve or the problems you create. Your value in this, in this, in this, your value in this life is determined by the problems you solve or by the problems you create. Why do we pay a garbage guy twelve, thirteen, fifteen dollars an hour, but we pay a brain surgeon two hundred fifty thousand dollars per surgery? They both solve problems, but the kinds of problems they solve are are have different values. If you want, guys, listen real carefully. If you, want, if you want a bigger paycheck, solve better problems. I can tell you how to get a raise. If you're, not, if you're not the owner of the business, I can tell you how to get a raise. Go start, go, go, to, your, go, to, your, <laughs> go to your supervisor. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, go to your supervisor and say, what problems do you have that, that you need solved? What can I take off your plate? You start solving more problems, you become more valuable to your company, and they will they will start express lining you up to the uh, 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 up the chain. Does this make sense? Because if you, the more responsibility you can handle, the more problems you can solve, the better and more valuable you become to that company. You're welcome. <laughs> See, the deal is, is that, you know, carpenters, carpenters, they solve problems. Mothers solve problems. Carpenters solve problems. Electricians solve problems. Uh, branding specialists solve problems. <laughs> they all, all, of, all, you know, whether you're, whether you're programming in computers Developing apps or developing developing programs, or whether you're on the uh, whether you're on the hardware side of it, they're all solving problems. But here's the deal: and so you you pay you buy you buy stuff that solves problems. <laughs> I got an email today about recliners or the massaging recliners, forty five percent off these massage. I'm like, people pay. $3,600 to sit and be massaged by this chair that's doing this thing at you. And I'm like, it's kind of scary, you know. What if something malfunctions and then it squeezes your head? <laughs> this it, you know. Did you get the visual? Did you get, the vi did you get that visual? 
Aren't you glad you came to church to, you know, squash your head like a pimple? It, but it solves a problem. Your clothes solve a problem. Glasses solve a problem. Everything, your shoes solve a problem. Guys, you buy stuff that solves problems. Your car, the car that you bought solves a problem. You may, you may say, well, you know, I, I like the, the outstanding qualities of this, this particular kind of brand of vehicle. Because this, but this, someone else may say, well, you know, but I like this brand of vehicle more. Both of them are, both of them choose the brand because of the way that it solves their problem. How many understand what I'm talking about? You want to be more, come more valuable. Ask God what problem he wants you to solve. Rather than you telling him what you're going to solve. Why don't you ask him what he wants you to solve? If you'll ask God what he wants you to solve, you'll be amazed at what he'll tell you. He'll put you in strategic places so you solve problems for him that nobody else can solve. You become very valuable in the kingdom. How do you do that? By faith. How do you do that? By faith. You're going to have to believe that God did. Now, let's, let's go over to Hebrews 11 one more time. We'll close with this. Y'all getting anything out of this? We started early so you can get it out of here early. So, but Hebrews chapter 11. Yes, sir. Thank you. Wow. Mm. I haven't talked about this in a long time. Might have been here the last time I talked about it years ago. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's start at verse 1. How many, how many know this scripture by heart? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things. Guys, while you're waiting on your healing, faith is the substance. While you're waiting on the manifestation, faith is the substance that you have until manifestation shows up. Faith is what I have waiting for substance to show up. I hope you get this. I hope you hear. I hope you see this. Faith is a substance. Faith is a substance. Faith is a sub. If I have faith, I have my hand. I have my hands around it. I can sink my teeth into it. I have my arms wrapped around it. Faith is a substance. It's something that makes me, it makes me do, uh, act a certain way. I call those things that be not as though they already were. I'm looking not at the things which are seen, but faith makes me look at things that are not seen. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't, see what we think is it, it doesn't exist. No, it exists, but I'm looking at something that doesn't exist here, but it exists. It is. It's there. It exists. And as long as I keep looking at that and keep acting by seeing that, it can't, it'll change this world. Faith is substance. It's what I have. I'm just waiting on God to heal me. No, you're not. You're not in faith. What do you mean I'm not in faith? Because you don't have any substance. Are you here? I don't get that. Faith is what I put that word. He says, I am the Lord thy God that healeth thee. Then that's what I'm settling the issue on. I'm settling the issue on that his word is bigger than the sickness in my body. His word is sub it's food to me. So I'm holding on to that word. Not in hope, but I'm holding on. I'm settled. I'm seeing well. I'm seeing myself whole. I'm seeing myself no limitations, no restrictions. I see myself blessed. I see myself holy. I see myself righteous. I see myself. Why? Because his word tells me that's what I am. And if I can find and determine what I am and what he says I am, then that's what I have my focus set on. And that is my substance well, you don't look like it. Yeah, I didn't say I look like it. I said I got substance though. And I am being changed. 
into that same glory that I'm looking at. That's the substance. Let's keep going. Faith is the substance of things. Faith is, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is evidence. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Well, what evidence do you have? My faith. Well, sure don't look healed. My, this is my evidence. 1 Peter 2, 24. Matthew 8, 17. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. That's my evidence. That evidence is a sure foundation because if it created the worlds, it'll create life in me. It's the evidence of things not seen for the, for, watch this, for by it, for by it, verse 2, for, I want you to pay attention to this, listen real carefully, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. So we go, what's the subject in verse 1? Faith. What's the subject in verse 2? For by it, the elders, for by faith, for by, well, let's put, let's substitute it for faith with, faith, with faith. For by faith, the elders, so he's got this, he's got the context is faith. And then the subcontext or the next paragraph or the next, the next subcontext would be the elders obtained a good testimony, right? So he will, goes from faith to elders. Everybody say faith. faith. Elders. Faith. faith. Elders. Faith. Elders. One more time. Faith. Faith. Elders. What happens in verse 3? Because in verse 3 he says. For by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. What are we talking about now? It sounds like we're talking about creation, right? It sounds like we're talking about creation. Now I preached this before. It's been a few years ago. Sounds like you're talking about, you know, Genesis 1, right? For by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are, not, are made by the things which are visible. Things which are seen were not made by the things which are visible. Sounds like creation. Thank God for Rick Renner. I like Rick Renner. And I was, I was reading through his stuff and he, and he explained this verse because I don't know Greek like he does. It's Greek to me. And, and he says here that this word, word, this word worlds, if it was the earth, it would be the Greek word G-A-I-U-S, however you say it, Gaius, you know. If it, was, if it was worlds or the universe, it would, be, it would be that word. But it's not that word. It's the word A-I-O-N-S in the Greek. And that word worlds means certain periods of high, certain periods of time, certain periods of time having a distinct end and beginning. Now listen real carefully. A distinct period of time having both a beginning and an end. Like a day is one of those examples. A week is is one of those kinds of examples. Or a month is one of those kinds of examples. He, he, he talks about these worlds, these worlds, by faith we understand that the worlds, these frame, time frames, were framed. That word frame, now, that, now it sounds like it's being created. But really, this Greek word here is not framed in the sense of creation. It is taking that which exists and remodeling it, restoring it, changing it, fixing it. Watch this. Listen real carefully, because this is where you guys are this uh, of this bunch. These certain periods of time were reconstructed, restored, remodeled, brought back to purpose by the word of God. So that the things that we actually that are seen the things that we actually read about were actually made from things which are not visible. Uh, the, the we're not made from things which are visible. In other words, God sent men into the earth and then put a word in their heart that changed the course of history. 
Change the course of history. Watch this. What about Noah? Here's a man in the here, here's a man in the midst of a perverse generation. A place where they had pushed the boundaries of sin to where God said, I'm sorry I even made man. That's, that, that's pushing it. I mean, it's bad now, but that's pushing it. He said, I'm sorry I even made, made man. And I'm going to reduce his years. I'm going to reduce his time span to 120 years. I'm going to reduce, because they were living nine, eight, nine hundred, uh, eight, hundred, nine hundred years. He said, because he said, man's heart is continually fixed on evil. He said, so I'm going to reduce his years to 120. And then he judged. But the thing about all in the midst of all that, he speaks to a man and says, Noah, I want you to build a boat. A what? A what? What's a boat? He had to give him a vision of it to be able to help him to understand what it was. He said, because it's going to rain. It's going to what? What's rain? What an Oregonians. Uh, <laughs> What's rain? It had never rained before because that that moisture was up in the in, in the firmament. And it was a green it had greenhouse effect. And, and he, it's going to rain. What's rain? It's where water's falling out. of. The, he had to show him a vision of it. And that word from God got him to acting on. What are you doing? Getting all that. Why are you cutting down all those trees? I'm building a boat. A What? And a whole gener it took him a gen almost a generation to build that dumb thing. That guy's got a huge budget. And he's crazy. He's a crazy man. No, he's not crazy. He's heard from God. Oh, one of those. Yeah, we've heard about him. We've heard about that. There are people all over the earth that are hearing about this guy. that has been building this thing, this building. Made out of wood because it's supposed to, what? Rain? And all the animals start coming in. And when he, when he got it done, all these animals start coming in two by two. But when that first clap of thunder happened, and the first drops of water come, well, that's what he was talking about. But it was too late by then. Doors already shut. Changed the course of history. Preserved history because of the word of God. Let me bring it down a little bit, a little bit easier. God tells a man and a woman to come to Eugene, Oregon. Start a church because he's heard from God. Because a visitation of the Holy Ghost is going to come to the Northwest. Unlike has ever come. Building a church. He's doing What? For a what? Because what's going to happen? Ah, you know, he even ordained his wife. My God. <laughs> he even ordained a woman, woman preacher. Can you believe that? That's God. That can't be of God. But it's coming. And guys, when we get to heaven, I know you want to hear the stories of what all the patriarchs. I, want, I, want, I know you want to sit down with Noah. I know you want to sit down with people and talk about that. But when you get there, they're going to want to know what it was like when you were living. They're going to want to know your story. What, were, what was it like to be in the, that last of the last days? What was it like to be in there where the glory of the Lord hovered over the earth like the waters hover, covered the sea? What was it like in the last of the last meeting where God poured out his spirit in an unprecedented measure? Where were you? Well, I was on Facebook. We have to understand something. We are, we, we are to be a very sober people. Yeah, joy, have, have fun in the Holy Ghost. But we are to be a sober about that. Lord, we don't want anything less than the glory. Thank you for all the things you've done. But Lord, thank you for what you're going to do. 
Thank you for all the blessings that you've done. Thank you for the previous services. Thank you for the previous moves of God. Thank you for all the things you did. Thank you for, for the changed lives. Thanks for the people that impacted so much. But Lord, we want more because this is not what you told us yet. But we're going to keep pressing on. By faith, we are marching to the sound of a drum that does that nobody else may be hearing. They may think, well, they're too wild over there. They're too loud over there. They go too long over there. But we are the passionate ones. That Lord, if it takes all that, then, draw, then pour out your glory in a way for us to see it. So that even the people that hate us will see your glory. They got to say, man, there's something about those people over there. The word of the Lord that has been on this church. Do you know how many prophecies have come over this church? Do you realize that God has been putting his word into you for years? Things like the power of God is going to arrest people that drive by. The words of the, the flames and the power of God is going to be seen on top of this roof. And that neighbors will come over wondering how is everything coming? Is everything okay? And they'll come in and get hit by the glory of God. There, there are prophecies about how that the power of God will go from this place and go get go to different cities, go to different places, there, and that that people will march out of here and people will carry anointings out of this place and they'll go and change cities and they're going to go change and they're going to go help people and they're going to you're going to see the, not only the poor but you're going to see the affluent. You're going to see nations and you're going to see the University of Oregon being touched by the power of God. That revival, that God is going to help use this church and others to, to see a revival at the university. I'm telling you, there's stuff that's been said about this church that has been precious seed. That he's going, this, this couple is bearing precious seed and they're holding on to something that maybe it, make, it makes them look peculiar. Maybe it makes them look a little odd. Maybe it makes them have to say maybe that's why they get a little upset about certain people when they take away from the protocol but they're burying precious seed and while they're burying precious seed they have one thing in con they have one thing like everybody else i'm holding on to something because we're about to change the course of history we're going to rewrite the entire course of history and when they're all when they start writing books about it, they're going to write about the time that eugene was transformed by the power of god What about all those that jump ship? I'm sorry. I don't know. The deal is, is that here, there are people of faith that won't take no for an answer. They won't take a government mandate or as a trade off. They're not going to be talked out of it because people don't understand it. Because a generation. Wants to make fun of it. God will get his glory. And he'll honor a man or a woman of faith. You can stand in the middle of the desert. And he'll build an oasis around you. Because the blessing is on you. And God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid of what men can do to me. I've had him tell me, God's done with you. All right. When he tells me, I'll quit. They told me, you're losing your mind. I already lost it. I agree. I got the mind of Christ that traded my old one in. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Let's stand together. You are a people of faith. Why faith? Changes your generation. Changes your generation. It'll subdue kingdoms. You please God with it. 
You live by it. You walk by it. You obtain promises by it. You protect yourself. You overcome the world by it. You change your generation by it. You rewrite history by faith. No other way you can do it. No other way you can do it. You are a people, a peculiar people. Not strange. Not strange. Peculiar. Distinctive. Distinguished. Why? Because of all the generations that you could have been born in. You're born for such a time as this. And now it's up to us to say, Lord, by faith, I take my destiny. I take my place in that restoration. I take my place in what you're doing. You've notched it out. You planned before the foundations of the earth. Lift your hands if you would, everybody. If you're there online and you're, and you're, and, and you're watching, I just challenge you to just lift your hands right where you're at. If you've been listening and this, is, this has challenged you, I want you to lift your hands right now, right where you're at. Whether you're on the couch or whether you're at your desk, if you're in the kitchen, wherever you're at, just lift your hands. I don't care who's around, just lift your hands because you are a child of destiny. You're a child of destiny. God has his hand on you. He bore, He knew when to, when to put mom and dad together to bring you into the earth for such a time as this. Father, I thank you that we will not settle for norm or normal, whatever the world has deemed as normal. Lord, we are a people that have destiny inscribed on us lord we do not glory in the achievements of others or the achievements of mankind we we're after the achievements and the advancement of heaven and what your interests are lord we want to solve your problems we want to respond the same way that isaiah did lord here am i not I'll go. You need to send me. Not I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll come up with my, I'll come up with the idea. No, Lord, you send me. Because if you'll send us, you send us with all the equipment. When you send us, you send us with all the provision. In the word of go that you send us with, you're sending us with everything that is needed to accomplish that go. And Father, I pray for each and every man, woman, boy, and girl in this place. Every young man, every young woman, I pray for them. That they will be renewed in the spirit of their mind. That they will see themselves not as just another person. But that you are ours and we are yours. And that we are a people that live, walk, and abide by faith. Now, whatever it is that you need, whatever you may, whatever you may be facing, you have a financial need, you have a, a, a family need, if you have a personal need, if, if you've been dealing with thoughts of suicide, if you've been dealing with just... Wanting to give up. Quit. Tonight's the night. To be set free from that. Well I just. I just. I just think I should quit. No. This is the night that you need to get refueled. And rather than putting the pressure on the preacher. Like I was doing in Tulsa that time. Putting the pressure on Kenneth E. Hagen. To prophesy. To confirm my calling. Confirm my value. Confirm my. To confirm my worthiness. To follow the call of God. It was much better coming. Straight from the person that did call me. It was a whole lot better coming from the author. And the finisher of my faith. Rather than coming from a prophet. 
And I have the utmost respect for, for, for those ministers. But I needed to hear it from Him. And you need to hear it from Him. He died just for you. He loves you. He's got a special plan for you. Don't you dare sell yourself short. Don't you dare sell yourself short. Father, whatever it is that they need. Lord, whatever people need in this room. If it's healing power. If it's answers. If it's wisdom. If it's open doors. If it's how to deal with a difficult person in their life. That just seems to be bound. They seem to be bound or like tied to. Lord, in the name of Jesus. We thank you that you supply every single need in this place. Would you take the hand of the person next to you right now and would you pray for them? And just just agree with that prayer right now. Lord, help them to see that you will that you have supplied every one of their needs. That you are opening doors now by faith. That you are Sending the la- you're sending wagons to feed. You're, 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 sending pe- you're speaking to people even now as they're exercising faith. That you're speaking to people to move on their behalf. You're talking in rooms that they, can't have, that they don't have physical access. In, that people are being speaking about them favorably. That people are being moved by your spirit because we're acting in faith. Father, I thank you. I thank you. For working all things for our good. We believe you. We believe you for that. Would you do that? Would you pray for them? Not just for yourself. Pray for them. That God's working it out for them. God's working it out for them. God's, God's silencing the turmoil that's in their mind. God, God is he's breaking the oppression. God is delivering them from the oppression. God is help opening up new ideas. New doors. Taking off the limitations. Off of their minds. And opening up a hallway of deliverance. What, what used to be the corner of, of, of bondage and being tr- cornered trapped, that corner is being d- opened up into a deliverance, a hallway of deliverance. And Father, we thank you for it. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory that you supply more than enough. That you are all sufficient. That you are the all sufficient one. That you supply it all And more than we can ask or even think. We believe you for it. If you believe that that person that you hold has a hold of your hand prayed genuinely and that God heard them. And that is working for you. I want you to throw both hands up in the air right now. You know what's coming. You need to start celebrating and saying, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, thank you, I got it, thanks, thank you, thank you, thank you, watch this, watch this, watch this, what happened, if you, I was, uh, it, I was in a shop today and I opened up a door for, for some ladies to come out and, and what they saw is they saw that I was preferring them. They saw the value of my, of my gift of honoring them. Not, it wasn't anything derogatory. They, they, they didn't, I've, I've opened up some doors for some people. They, I, can, I can open up my own doors. I'm like, okay, well, I'll let it go then. But the deal is what they saw, what, watch this, what they saw was they saw the, the, the value that I place on honoring them. And so they said, thank you. The moment you believe God has given you something, you see the value of what he's given to you. And what you do is when you see the value of what you've given, what you've been given and that you've got it now, that that word has now become life to you. There's only one thing to do, and that is to say, thank you. 
So do that right now. If you believe God's put something in your heart, if you believe that your, that your need has been supplied, if you believe that, then see the value of what he has done in you and has done for you and is doing through you and begin to thank him. Begin to thank him. Begin to tell him how much you appreciate how far he went to send Jesus to make sure you could get the stuff you need. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. There's a part, there is a, a thank you party going on. There's a thank you party going on. Hallelujah. Mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. Turn to somebody and said, I got mine tonight. Just tell them. Just tell them. I got mine tonight. I got mine tonight. I got just what I needed. I got just what I wanted. I got just what I want. I got just what I wanted from the Lord. Y'all too young for that, I guess. Hallelujah. That's an old one. <laughs> Can we just celebrate him one more time? Can you just celebrate him? Come on. Just come on. Take about 20 seconds and just celebrate the presence of the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Amen. You guys be seated for a second. Do you feel the spirit of faith in here? Yes. We having the same spirit of faith, we believe, and so therefore we speak. Amen. I want you to pull something up for me, Gil. You know, uh, there's a, a verse that kept going over and over and over and in me, and it was uh, Hebrews 11, 33 in the Passion. In the Passion Translation. Because let me tell you, there's promises that God speaks to all of us right out of the Word. But then I just felt like the Lord said there's promises, individual promises the Lord has given you. And boy, the enemy's trying to get you to surrender those. And you can't. Do not surrender. Look how it says here. Through faith's power, they conquered kingdoms and established true justice. Their faith fasted on to their promises and pulled them into reality. Otherwise, it reached across the line into the invisible realm, and it grabbed something God said is yours. And it, 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 you know that pull could be a pull, just pull it straight in, or it could be just a, I'm going to pull till I see it. And that's what the Lord says to some of you. Listen, don't back up. Well, maybe I didn't hear. You heard. You heard. Amen. You didn't doubt when he told you, but over time you begin to doubt. Amen. You know, we have a, a great opportunity as we end this service. We're going to be uh, receiving an offering for Jeff Taylor Ministries, right? And, I, you know, I've been teaching out of 2 Corinthians 8 chapter, and, and there's two, two words that keep coming in there, and it's the Macedonians, right? And then the word generous keeps showing up. The word generous. I felt like the Lord just, we're going to read some verses tonight before we receive this offering for Jeff Taylor Ministries. And I want you to go, Gil, go to uh, Philippians 4.10 in the Passion. How many know when he was talking last night, you know, off the air, just about some things that the Lord has done for him personally, but I like the way he differentiated between what was the ministry and what was personally, right? And what we're given into is, and you know, he shared some of the places the Lord has put in his heart. I don't know about you. I, I want to be a part of those things. And we have been in the past. Amen. It says, uh, my heart overflows with joy, Paul writes, when I think of how you showed your love to me by your what? Of my what? Wow. Is that showing love? It yeah, absolutely is. And then it says this, for even though you have so little, that's what we saw in 2 Corinthians 8, where Paul's trying to teach the church at Corinth how to give. Right? And he says, now the Church of Macedonia, they had nothing, and they entered into this, right? He said, even though they have so little, you still continue to help me at every opportunity. He says, I'm not telling you this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be satisfied in any, any circumstance. Look at this next verse. I know what it means to lack. You ever been there, brother? <laughs> you know, ramen, you talked about ramen and... And biscuits, right? Sometimes the, the Raymond meal was peanut butter and crackers. I've lived on that for a while. How many of you have ever lived on that? Peanut butter and crackers, right? 
So I don't have a lack. He says, I know what it means to experience what? Overwhelming abundance. Then he goes on, he says, for I'm trained, I like this, I'm trained in the secret of what? Overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger. And I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. He said, you've so graciously provided for my essential needs during this season of difficulty, Paul writes. I want you to know that the Philippian church was what? The only church. Out of all those letters, not Ephesus, not Colossians, this was the only church that supported me in the beginning as I went out to preach the gospel. You were the only church that sowed into me financially. When I was in Thessalonica, you what? Well, over a year. Next verse. I mention this not because I'm requesting a gift, but so that fruit, the fruit of your what? See, that, this is so key. I'm going to talk about, you know, as we receive the offering tomorrow night, I'm going to talk about this, that, that generosity is really what it's all about. Generosity, just, just having that cheerful giver's heart. And, and even the, the amount sometimes is not the point. How many remember when the, the Jesus was uh, watching everybody giving the offering? I always thought that was, that was kind of a funny story because he's like this. And then, you know, and I thought about the woman with the two mites. Now, she's standing in a line of people that got a lot of stuff. And, you know, sometimes when you got less than, you kind of feel shame, maybe you're, you know. And, and, and can you see her getting up in the line looking, going, oh, who's that guy? And he's, and I could just see, you know, people putting their gifts in, but she's like, and the Lord just stops everything. Hey, did you see that? Well, she probably gave less than everybody in that line, but her generous heart is what captured the Lord. She was being generous. He says she gave out of every, she gave everything she had. Aren't you, aren't you glad that when you get to heaven, you could hear the rest of the story? You bump into her eventually, you know, like eternity goes on forever. I don't care how many people are there forever. You're going to talk to her sometime and you're going to hear her story. And she'll tell you the rest of what happened to those two mites after she did with that. That generous heart. Everybody say generous heart. Said the fruit of your generosity may bring you an abundant reward. I now have all I need more than enough. I'm abundantly satisfied. For I've received the gift you sent by Epaphroditus and viewed it as a sweet sacrifice, perfumed with the fragrance of your faithfulness which is so pleasing to God. Now, here's a familiar verse, maybe said a little different. I'm convinced that my God will fully satisfy your what? Every need you have. For I've seen the abundant riches of glory revealed to me through the anointed one, Jesus Christ. See that generous heart, guys. I know a lot of you have already given, but maybe some that haven't. And I know the last couple nights, you guys that have been watching online, just because of the way the services went and there was some personal things going on in here. So they just kind of shut off the cameras at the end. So you, you, man, I, Hey, how about me? Well, this is a night that you can give. If you need an envelope, raise up your hand. They'll get you one. Now online, if you're watching while they're doing that, if you want to, if you want to, there, there's really two ways we're going to have you give it's give online at the website, or you can mail in a gift. Just make sure you put Jeff Taylor on there. Everything in this ministry is, or everything in this offer is going into his ministry. Okay? But, yeah, mail in or go ahead and put the website up there again. And the reason I'm only giving you those two, because the text to give is a little tougher to differentiate, isn't it? At least Carol. As far as we don't have anything on there that said we have to, if, if we were going to do a text to give, we'd have to get a whole new number and do that. So we'd rather have you do these two ways if you're online watching. And you know what? Just with that generous heart, cheerful heart, connect with, with uh, this ministry. Amen? Amen. Anybody else? Well, we pray. We'll get your offering in your hand. Father, we're so grateful. And Lord, what was given tonight? Top notch, full of the Holy Ghost, spirit of faith teaching. Life changing, God. Life changing. 
Lord, I pray that even the things that were said tonight, that, that they would keep by the Holy Ghost those things that were said. This is, this is what changes your life. It's not just a sermon. This is a Holy Ghost deposit that came tonight. Faith, Lord God, that pleases you. Because we give, we give in faith. We thank you. We ask you to bless Jeff Taylor Ministries. We ask you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, these things that are in their heart, these places that are in their heart, I pray you supply every need for this. And those that give, Lord, let the fruit of their gen generosity be blessed. Meet their every need according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Receive the gifts of the people. Thank mm -hmm. you.